Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutors Star Course series where we all know that Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon, but not as many of us know that maybe his most impressive accomplishment wasn't even on an Apollo mission. It was on an entirely different mission altogether. And so we've got our friends, Chris and Greg from the Armstrong Air and Space Museum in Ohio here to tell us all about it and to get us into the cockpit of, uh, of one of those missions to find out all about Neil's wild ride. Now, before I turn it over to them to, uh, to get us started, I want to make sure we all kind of know our, our mission here for today. Um, one, we're going to keep it really interactive. So use the chat panel to the right of the screen to answer their questions, to ask questions that you may have you know, throughout the program. Don't wait to be called on, and that we'll interview them with your questions at the end. Or if you just can't help it and you need to type in, Houston, we have a problem, feel free as well, but let's keep it really interactive. Also, make sure you've got a camera nearby because in about a half an hour, we're going to give everybody an opportunity to lean into the screen and get a selfie with one of the biggest stars in world history, maybe universe history, Neil Armstrong himself. Um, and so we have that camera ready. If you upload that to Instagram after class and tag the Armstrong Air and Space Museum and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered, entered to win a prize package that includes three free months of VC Plus with Varsity Tutors. We'll tell you more about that on the way out and uh, you know, a, a great book about Neil Armstrong called First Man. I think we can fill in the, uh, the blanks on the rest of that. So with all that said, let me turn it over to the Armstrong Air and Space Museum to, uh, to take us on a wild adventure up into space. Chris, take it away. All right. Well, hey, thank you for joining us tonight here at the Armstrong Air and Space Museum. So my name is Chris. I'm the Director of Education Guest Experience here. And we're also going to be joined tonight by Greg Brown. He is our experience coordinator here at the museum to talk about Neil's wild ride aboard the Gemini 8 spacecraft. But before we begin with anything, let's go ahead and look a little bit about the history of the museum and a little bit about the museum itself. But let's test our knowledge. Why do you think they would build a museum in Walpuckinet, Ohio? So if you look to the right hand side of your screen there, you can go ahead and type in your answer selection. Why do you think that they would build a museum in Walpuckinet, Ohio? And as you guys are looking at that, we'll talk a little bit about, too, where Walpuckinet, Ohio is. So it's a northwest Ohio area. And if you look where Dayton City is and where Toledo is, we're about 60 miles north or south from that given area. So why do you think that would be? I'm seeing some answers come in here. OK, because they wanted to, maybe. That's a possibility. Ooh, look at that one. Somebody said maybe a celebrity was from that area. So I think we're in the mall. We just got to find the right store there. And let's see. Oh, there it is because of Neil Armstrong. Very good. Neil Armstrong was born on the outside of Walpuckinet, Ohio, between here and another town called New Knoxville. His father was a state auditor. They never really lived in the same area for more than three years. They traveled all over Ohio, living in different towns. But Neil would come back to Walpuckinet, Ohio in high school, and he would experience fly early on, but he would learn to fly in Walpuckinet, Ohio. And you can see that the museum, it was built in 1972, so it was three years to the day after the moon landing. And if you were to go through the museum, you would see some different artifacts there. So inside the museum, we have the Gemini 8 capsule. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight with Neil's Wild Ride. You can see an actual lunar sample. So if you look off in the corner there, you'll be able to see that. How many of you think that just looks like maybe just a rock that you see in your backyard or something? Yeah, it kind of has that appearance, but that is a lunar sample that was picked up by either Neil Armstrong or Dr. Aldrin aboard the Apollo 11 mission. You can see two different space suits. There's one that was Neil's um, training suit that he used. And then we also have the suit that he used aboard the Gemini 8 mission. And there's much more that you can see throughout that we have, just in case if you're in Walpuck in Ohio, would like to stop by and take a look at what we have too as well. And it was Governor Rose that said, you know what, we're going to put a museum in Walpuckinet, Ohio, and we're going to put some money there, but we're going to have a different design for the museum. So they got some architects to build this design. So you could see an early picture there of what the museum looked like in the 1970s when it was built, and then an artist depiction of what it looks like today. So when they built it, they said, you know what, we're going to build it to look like a moon base. Why do you think that is? So now I'm testing your knowledge again here. So if you look to the right hand side of your screen where you can fill in an answer, go ahead and type in. Why do you think that they would want to build it to look like a moon base? 
And while you guys are typing in your answers there, and as I start to see them come up on the screen, we've had people pull off the highway and say, gee, what's that golf ball on the hill? Or, hey, it looks like something's like rising from the ground, like maybe like you have a head and it looks like bird wings, like something's flapping to go off. Well, you know, take off. Maybe, you know, if you're looking at planes, I'm seeing some answers start to come in. Okay. They were looking at building the moon base because of the future aspect of it maybe because of astronauts themselves very good Ooh, okay basically the question and the answer are related so they wanted to build it to look like a moon base because they thought hey we've landed people on the moon now we're going to end up going to the moon someday and building bases and building structures unfortunately though we haven't been back to the or we haven't been back to the moon since 1972 since the museum was actually built so that's over 50 years ago with people so kind of sad for us but you guys could potentially be the astronauts to get us back to the moon or to mars or you could be the engineers or the future of nasa getting us there and getting the people there so who knows we could be taking vacations to the moon someday or to mars someday because of you our viewers tonight but you could encounter different situations and problems and that's what they encountered on neil's wild ride with david scott aboard the gemini 8 capsule and aboard that mission itself and <laughs> look at the guys there I, I get cracked up when i see that they're just sitting there their sunglasses on hey everything's cool everything happened nicely in reality, their heads were spinning, literally. Greg's going to tell you why here in a minute. Their heads were spinning. They were way far off course, so far off course, that when they saw the destroyer in the distance, it was actually a different ship that was coming to pick them up from the United States because they were in the wrong ocean from what they were supposed to be at. It was only 11 hours into the flight that they had to call off the flight and come back home because they encountered a problem. This flight encountered the first in-flight problem that astronauts had to solve and if they solved it wrong it could have proved to be fatal for them and that would not have been good they were able to come home safely of course you saw them sitting there but we're going to put you guys in the commander's seat tonight to make some of those same decisions to see would you be able to come home safely and how would have you have solved the problem so here's what the mission accomplished it was the second rendezvous in space the first docking in space of two spacecraft the first in-flight emergency did happen too and that was what almost ended in disaster because if you're looking at it now when they were sitting there they're like oh my gosh could this maybe enable us not to be able to go to the moon they did not know what happened. They had to look at the debrief. They had to look at what took place. All they know is, is that they were able to come home safely. So that's what you guys are going to be testing out tonight. So when we do that for the test and going to the moon and what it required for learning, Greg is going to be getting into that. He's going to give you a crash course a little bit on aerodynamics and actually flying spacecraft and what it takes. And then he's going to put you in the commander seat to make those decisions. So with that said, I'm going to introduce Greg Brown. He's going to come into frame here. He's going to be working with you on Neil's wild ride. So Greg, take it away. Well, welcome to this presentation. Thank you for joining us. My name is Greg Brown. I'm the experience coordinator here at the Armstrong Museum. And as Chris said, you know, this is about a mission that almost uh, was a disaster. But we have to set the stage. We have to go back a little bit and we have to ask ourselves a question. What is Project Gemini trying to accomplish? And what we need to do is we need to figure out how to go to the moon. This was Gemini's entire purpose for existence. So if we're going to go to the moon, we've got some new information we have to learn. We have to learn a bunch of new skills. So two of those skills are really, really critical. And those are rendezvous. And this is a French word that means to meet together at the same time and the same place. That's a very important first step. But we also then have to, once we rendezvous, we have to find a way to connect two spacecraft together physically. This would be just like playing with Legos and snapping two of those Legos together. So this is what we have to do before we can go to the moon. Okay, so let's just uh, go and, and take a look at the mission patch here. The crew members, Neil Armstrong and David Scott, and those names are on the, the patch there. And you may not know this, but this is kind of a neat thing. Uh, the military has patches and NASA has patches. Mission patches that NASA uses are very similar to those military patches. They tell a story. They are symbolic. 
They're explaining something about the mission or about that unit. So here we see two stars. If you look at those uh, two little diamonds that are gold up on top there, those are stars. They are the Gemini twins, Castor and Pollux. The light is coming down into a prism and that prism is breaking up that light into a spectrum of colors. And this spectrum was going to be the objectives that Gemini 8 was supposed to achieve. So Gemini was tasked with learning a whole bunch of new skills. Gemini 8 is supposed to learn really three. They're supposed to perfect three. One, rendezvous. Two, docking. And actually, David Scott was scheduled to do a spacewalk or EVA, extravehicular activity. Now, this is the liftoff, actually a picture of Gemini Titan 8. And this is the one that we're talking about. This is in the late morning of the March 16th of 1966. So what you're looking at is the rocket and the spacecraft. And I have a model of that rocket. So this is the Ch Gemini Titan. Now, if you look at the top here, and I'm going to show you a bigger model, this black and white portion is the actual Gemini spacecraft. But let me put this down and pick up a bigger model of the Gemini spacecraft. So now you can see kind of what it looks like, a little bit small on the top of that rocket there. So this is what you're looking at on top of that rocket. This is where the two astronauts were located inside, and we're gonna talk more about this. But we wanna talk a little bit about rocket propulsion first. Now we're not gonna go into a lot of math and a lot of high uh, technical terms. We're just gonna explain how rocket engines work because this is how we get to the moon. This is how we get into orbit. And this is how we maneuver around in orbit. So how does a rocket engine work? Very simply, if you throw exhaust out one side, like out of the engine, you're going to move in the other direction. Simple to, re to remember, okay? You fire your engine one way, you're going to go the other way. That's all there is to it, okay? So now you hopefully have that in your mind, and we're going to go on. Now, in order to rendezvous or meet up with another spacecraft in orbit, you have to do a couple of things. You have to find this other spacecraft up there, and we use radar for that, actually. And then you have to, once you find out where that other spacecraft is, you have to control your spacecraft so that you can move from where you are to that other spacecraft's location. So you have to be able to change your spacecraft's orbit. And so how do we do that? Well, there's two ways that we do that. We actually control our spacecraft in attitude and in translation. So let's start with attitude. Now, attitude is not the way you feel, okay? I woke up this morning and I had a, I had a great attitude. No, that's not really what we're talking about. Attitude is just the way a spacecraft is pointing. Now, let me show you what I mean. This is a Gemini spacecraft and it's pointing, let's say, over there. You're here, it's pointing over there. Well, it could point right at you and it could actually move toward you, but we'll talk about that later. So this is what we mean by attitude. It's which way the spacecraft is pointing. Okay, now what about translation? Well, translation is not going from English to Spanish or from Spanish to French. It's actually moving in a straight line. So we're gonna talk about what this actually looks like. Now you can see a diagram here and this is fine, but I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail. So you see the, the blue arrows around these lines that point up and down to the right and down to the left and so forth. This, this is showing you rotation, and this is the key concept to remember when we're talking about attitude. Rotation, okay? So let's talk about attitude. So if I have the spacecraft here, I'm going to actually uh, stop screen sharing. I'm going to show you in a, a large uh, picture here, okay? Hopefully everybody can see me a little bit better now and see the spacecraft. Now I'm pointing the spacecraft directly at you, okay? Kind of like aiming it right at you. Now... If I want to control the spacecraft's attitude, I can fire little thrusters, little rocket engines back here, and I can do three things. I can roll the spacecraft. You notice how it's rolling to the left? I can roll it to the right. And if I want to make the spacecraft nod, like I'm saying, yeah, I understand you. I can actually tip the nose down and bring it back up. I'm kind of like, I'm in a conversation with you. I'm nodding, okay? Yeah, I agree with you. And this is actually called pitch. This is pitch down, this is pitch up. What about if I wanna say, no, I don't buy that at all. I can actually waggle the spacecraft's nose back and forth like this, and that's called yaw. Yaw, not yawn, yaw, okay? 
<clears throat> now, what if I want to move from one place to another? Let's say I want to move from where I am to where you are. So I can actually move in a straight line in any direction. And this is called translation. What if I fire my thrusters back here and I move straight forward right toward the camera? Whoa, right in your face there, huh? And if I move this way because I fire thrusters back here, I need to fire other thrusters to slow, slow down or stop. I don't want to crash into the camera, do I? Run into your living room. No. So that's translation. We can actually move up. We can move down. We can move side to side. Okay? So those are translational maneuvers. So attitude, remember, means rotation. Translation means straight line in whatever direction you're talking about, okay? So let me go back here, plug myself back in, and now we're gonna move forward a little bit, and we can see that the spacecraft has these little rocket engines, little thrusters at the rear, and depending on which combination of them you fire, you will either roll, pitch, or yaw. These are attitude, remember, rotation, okay? And translation, we talked about that. It's straight line, and we can actually add or decrease our speed. We can actually subtract speed. We can add speed. And when we do this, we can change the shape of our orbit, and that allows us to catch up to another spacecraft. So right here, we have a picture of the Gemini spacecraft. On the left, if you look at the very bottom, bottom left, you'll see an arrow pointing to those little black dots. Those are thrusters, and those are attitude thrusters. And then if you look at the arrow above, you'll see these are translation thrusters. These allow you to move the spacecraft in a straight line. If you look over to the right, we have two thrusters in the back of the spacecraft, one here and one there. And those allow the spacecraft to move forward. Remember what we said? Move forward right toward you, okay? And that is translation. So that's very important to remember because this is how we actually get to another spacecraft and then connect. Now, inside the Gemini spacecraft we have on display, this is the hand controller right there. You see that? That is the, you could call it a joystick, because that's what it is. So this is what Neil Armstrong would use and did use on this mission with his right hand on that controller. And remember, this is attitude, so this means rotation of the spacecraft, okay? Now, we see a view of the forward panel on the commander's side, and Neil was the commander of this mission. So this is what he would have seen looking straight forward. Notice that little arrow down there on the left. Now, Neil Armstrong would have put his left hand on that ball and pushed it in or pulled it out and moved that around to provide translational control. And what is that again? Straight line motion, okay? Now, on this mission, Gemini 8, we have to find another spacecraft in orbit, and this is called the Agena Target Vehicle. This is a unmanned booster. There's nobody on this spacecraft, and it's placed up there ahead of them. It's waiting for them to find it, okay? And it's very, very anxious, okay, to have them find it, I'm sure. So this vehicle, when it was launched, weighed 7,000 pounds. Eh, that's a decent amount of weight. They rendezvoused with this vehicle on that morning, six hours after they lifted off from Florida, okay? It took them six hours to change their orbit by doing those maneuvers we talked about, translation and rotation, attitude, okay? Now, in order for the crew to actually talk to the Agena and prepare it, they were able to talk to it through L-band radar. And if you look at that picture over there on the right, or away from you, you'll see a black knob there. That is how David Scott sent commands to the Agena through L-band radar. Think of it like Wi-Fi. We're all familiar with Wi-Fi, we use it all the time. Well, in the 60s, really didn't have the same thing that we have today, but they actually had a form of it, and it was using radar. So actually, David Scott could send orders to the Agena through this knob. Kind of handy. Now, when these two vehicles docked, they had been flying around each other for about a half an hour, okay? So now you see an image of what these two spacecraft looked like connected in orbit. And again, this was the first time in history that this had been done. Big, big deal, okay? In order to go to the moon, we are going to have to do this. So now these two vehicles are connected. It's a total of about 16,000 pounds if you were to take them down to Earth and weigh them, okay? 
So we've got a 16,000 pound vehicle now orbiting the Earth. Now this is an eight ball, it's in front of Neil and in front of Dave, it's an instrument that shows you if you are flying in level flight, if you are rolled or if you're pitched or if you're yawed. So remember what, what this is, this is pitch and this is yaw and this is roll. And if you're doing any of those things, this ball will tell you that. So actually, if you look at this ball, it's showing you in level flight. And that means with your head up uh, away from the earth, with your feet toward the earth, and you can see that the ball, the light on top, the dark on the bottom, that line in between is level, it's horizontal. That means you're flying in level flight. And this is usually what you want, okay? Usually what you want. Now with the Gemini spacecraft, losing radio communication with the ground, they're actually leaving a tracking station. These two spacecraft began to roll counterclockwise or to the left. So remember we talked about roll, they were rolling to the left. Now, David Scott saw this on his eight ball and he's not sure exactly why this is going on. The crew could see out in front of them, but they could not see behind them. And they also noticed they have lost some propellant, let's just say gas, okay, they've lost some gas. So they're not sure what's going on. But it's Dave that notices his eight ball, remember this is the attitude gyro, this is the indicator for your attitude, and he looks up there, you see this image, and he says to Neil, hey, we're in a left-hand bank. Now, you can substitute the word roll for bank, and they mean the same. So let's take a look here. What does this show us? Well, that pink arrow that's pointing up there, kind of at a strong angle, that is where the horizon is. But here's where that line should be. Wow, there's a difference, isn't there? So what this means is the terrain, the horizon is coming up on their left, that means the spacecraft is rolling toward the left. This is not what's supposed to happen. Okay, these guys are really puzzled. Now, let's get to the part of this presentation in this lesson where you, the viewer, are going to put yourself in the commander's seat and you're going to try to figure out how to solve this problem. Really, it'd be nice if you could figure out what's causing the problem first and then maybe you can solve it. So this is the view that Neil had in the spacecraft and now we're going to see what you think about the solution. So based on what we talked about, attitude being rotation and translation being straight line motion, what do you think the cause of this problem might be? So they're in a left-hand roll, okay? So you have your choices here. A, is the Agena firing its rotational thrusters? Is B, the Gemini firing rotational thrusters? What about C? Is the Agena firing its large engine to the rear? Is that what's causing the roll? Or maybe, maybe one of these guys is just sneezing too hard. You know, sometimes, depending on how strong you sneeze, you can really shake things up. Maybe that's what the problem is, you know? So you have to put on your thinking caps. Okay, so I'm starting to see some answers coming in and it looks like you're, uh, yeah, some of you I think are on the right track. There's a few of you that are just, I might even be playing around, but nonetheless, okay, uh, keep on answering those questions, okay, because we're trying to solve problems here. So what do you think it is? Well, the answer is actually A, the Agena firing its rotational thrusters. Now notice, this is what the astronauts are thinking. This may not be what the actual cause is. This is what these two gentlemen are seeing out the window. This is what they believe. So what did they do? Well. Based on their visual cues, the crew believed the Agena to be misfiring its thrusters, something of that nature, even maybe venting. So Armstrong, the commander, tells David Scott, the pilot, to shut off the Agena thrusters, the attitude control system. And remember we talked about that little knob? Well, that's how he sent this command to the Agena. So he's going to tell the Agena to stop firing. Here's the thing. They wanted to find out, would this solve the problem? Would this stop the rolling or even slow it down? So this is what they did. Now the bad news is this did not really solve the problem. They still have a roll going on, okay? So now let's, let's think about the next step here. If shutting off the Agena did not solve the problem, what do you think they might need to do next? A, fire the Gemini thrusters to produce more left-hand roll? Hmm, maybe that'll scare the thing into doing the right thing. I don't know. What about B, fire the Agena's engine? Maybe if we move the spacecraft to a lower orbit, they might be safer. Maybe that will help the problem. 
What about C? Close your eyes and use the force, Luke. I don't know. That might work. It works in the movies, right? What about D? Fire the Gemini thrusters to create a right-hand roll. Okay? So see what you think. Um, uh, type your answers in there. And uh, yes, some of you are being very creative, and, and that's a good thing. Um, so yeah, yeah, that, that looks good. That, that's... You're just about there, okay? You're in the right track, all right? So what is the actual answer? Well, the answer is D, fire the Gemini thrusters to create a right-hand roll. This is what they decided to do. Now, Armstrong did this, okay? He's firing those thrusters. But this really does not stop the problem either. They still have a left-hand roll going on. Now, this is really puzzling to these guys, okay? They have not actually practiced or rehearsed this particular emergency. And right now, it's not an emergency. It's, it's a problem, okay? So they believe the agena to be the primary cause, but they were still a little unsure. The only thing they could think of was, we need to undock, get away from the agena, and solve the problem. Maybe stabilize our spacecraft that way. So they did. They undocked, okay? And now, once they did, guess what? The Gemini spacecraft begins to rotate even faster to the left. This is a problem, okay? The speed is now one revolution per second. That's 360 degrees per second. These two guys are in danger of blacking out. The blood is getting forced into their heads. They are going to black out. This now is a life-threatening crisis. So they decide to use another set of thrusters called the RCS. This is the reentry control system. So let's take a look at these little holes here. Those are those thrusters that they're going to use to try to stop the spinning. Now, the bad side of this is these thrusters are only used for steering when you come home. When you come back to the atmosphere, these will help you steer. But they don't have a choice. This has really become a life-threatening crisis. Now, let's look inside the spacecraft here, and Neil Armstrong is going to use the control system. He's going to power up the RCS, and those switches there, he uses those to turn on the RCS, and he uses this knob here to put it in direct mode, direct mode, okay? So what he's going to do is grab that stick that we saw earlier. Remember the joystick? He's going to grab that with his right hand, and he's literally going to take that stick, and he's just going to crank it over to the right, and he's going to hold it. And for the next six and a half minutes, and that seemed, I'm sure, like an eternity to these guys, he's cranking that stick over and holding it, and he's firing those thrusters, and he's slowing the spacecraft down, and he's slowing it down. Well, they were able to save their lives by this course of action, but it was a little hairy. And now they've got another problem. So here's the actual indication of what they're doing. So if you see this part uh, right here up on the top where it says roll. The white arrow is the direction they were rolling. The pink arrow is the direction they're trying to go to counteract that left-hand roll. So these thrusters are what he's using to stop that spin. Now, this is a shot of the actual spacecraft in our gallery. And if you look at those openings right there, you'll see those two thrusters were actually used to stop this spinning. They are 25 pound thrust rocket engines. That's what they are. So that's what he was actually using when he was firing those thrusters. Now, unfortunately, as I mentioned, when they use this system, this really ends the mission because these are only used for re-entry. So now they've got to cut their mission short. And this is a real bummer for these guys. They have pr practiced and trained so hard for this, but they're going to have to come home. Now, on their seventh orbit, only 10 hours after launch, they fire those rockets in the back of the spacecraft to slow them down, and they're going to have to come back to Earth. Gravity is going to take over and pull them back. So now that we've at least stabilized the spacecraft, and we know we're not going to die now, we're not going to black out, so now we have to ask ourselves a question. Why do you think, why are you the viewer, why do you think the spinning got worse once we separated from that agena? Okay, so type your answers in that answer window. Now, we've talked about this, but we really didn't go into a lot of detail, and we didn't want to go into some, you know, discussion about uh, orbital mechanics, uh, but think about it in everyday life. You know, maybe that will help you uh, answer this question. If you start out with a mass, amount of stuff, and then you get rid of some of that stuff, if you're spinning, think about being on a, I'm not a Ferris wheel, but a, a 
merry-go-round. Think about that, okay? So, yeah, it looks like you're, you're, you're thinking. Yeah, looks like you're doing a good job there of uh, putting on your thinking caps and trying to think this through. So, in actuality, the reason that they spun up was because they got rid of half their mass. And you can imagine if you're skating on a, a, a skating rink and you see somebody doing a spin and they pull their arms close to their body, they will actually spin faster. And that's, that's very much like what happened, okay? Very much like what happened. So what did actually cause the problem? We never really talked about that. And this was something that these astronauts had to deal with because they didn't know either until later. So let's just see what they actually had to deal with. This is number eight attitude thruster firing by itself. You see that white thing looks almost like a feather? That's exhaust from a number eight thruster right there. And that got stuck open. There was a wiring short. And these guys didn't know that. You know, think about this. You see these windows? This is where the windows are. They're looking out to the right. They can't see back here. So isn't that kind of a puzzle? You're rolling around. You don't even know why. This would have been a really hairy thing to deal with. Okay, so this is the real cause of this problem. And they didn't know it until after they solved the problem that they went back and did some troubleshooting. So that's pretty hairy stuff to deal with on your first mission into space, don't you think? So here's a picture of Neil and Dave and the three guys from the Air Force that helped recover them. And they feel pretty good now, but they didn't feel so good when they first hit the water. These guys are Air Force pararescue guys. They normally picked up down pilots. Uh, in this case, they were closer than anybody else, so they picked up these guys. So this is the third star of the show, okay? You've got Neil Armstrong, you've got David Scott, and you have the Gemini 8 reentry module. This spacecraft right here is in our museum. It's a wonderful artifact. To me, it's actually worth the price of admission, but then, you know, that's me. So at any rate, do you have any questions for us? We're actually going to transition now. And we're going to go to the screen that will allow you to do a selfie with the stars. So, Chris. Thank you, guys. I can uh, can jump in and introduce this. Yeah, we, uh, we, you know, for those who have come to a lot of these classes, we always do a moment of, uh, of selfie with the stars for you. And uh, in this case, uh, we have two, you know, absolute rock stars in uh, Neil Armstrong and, uh, and David Scott. So um, we want you guys to lean into the screen, get a picture with uh, with Neil and David. We'll, uh, we'll also on the way out, make sure we have the instructions for you. But if you go on Instagram and tag Varsity Tutors and Armstrong Space is the, uh, the, the Instagram tag for the Armstrong Air and Space Museum. You'll be entered to win um, the, uh, the book First Man about Neil Armstrong. And, and all about as many exploits, in, including this mission, and three free months of uh, VT Plus, where you can learn basically anything under the sun, um, including uh, rocket science. So if you want to learn more about that, click the link on your screen. But without further ado, let's uh, let's get our, the stars of today's show up on the screen so, uh, so you can get that photo. All right. And hopefully people got great pictures. Um, we also know you guys have been asking some great questions as well. And so uh, we want to make sure we, uh, we take advantage of, uh, of our experts, um, Chris and Greg being here to, uh, to answer some of these questions. So thanks for all your questions. You've got plenty of time to get those in. We've got about 10 minutes here. We'll, uh, we'll interview these guys with, uh, with your questions. And so um, with that in mind, a couple that, uh, that have come up for you guys. Um, one that a lot of people really wanted to know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, the mission, um, got cut short. Um, what else was, uh, you know, were they trying to accomplish and, you know, what did they miss out on doing and, uh, and how much did that, you know, really set NASA back in terms of, uh, what they wanted to learn from this mission? Well, um, the one part that they missed out on was that EVA. So David Scott was unable to do his extravehicular activity. Um, so that was the part of the mission that they had already done EVAs before in the past, but that could have helped further our knowledge and growth with that. 
And then Greg, you could probably talk about more of the post mission though too, what they had to go through for just the funding and will we be able to continue to the Apollo program? Yeah, so this, this mission nearly uh, stalled our program uh, for many, many years, it could have, because had they not been able to solve the problem, these guys potentially would have been lost and we not would not have had a good idea of what caused it because of the nature of this malfunction. But they were supposed to do an EVA, as Chris said, they were supposed to test some equipment and they were supposed to do about 10 experiments. They really weren't able to do almost any of those experiments, but it didn't really put them back too far because on the very next mission, they did do a, a decent EVA. Uh, David Scott's EVA would have been the first working EVA actually. Uh, but yeah, so they were, they were a little behind, but actually they were able to catch up. But uh, yeah, the, the issue was they had to actually go back and do some rewiring of the thruster system so that that same problem could not happen again. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, we uh, we were doing. We've got some classes here with uh, with a former astronaut, Lewin Melvin, who did a class with us last week. And one of the things he was even talking about was how much training they do for things like if you have to land in a remote part of Earth. And then you know, I was talking about it, and he even said. Yeah, it's not necessarily because they care about me. It's they've invested so much money in training me. They don't want to lose it. And right. uh, so you realize, you know, how much money goes into these missions, how much effort of all the people on the ground to uh, to get oh. that capsule ready. And then to have that not happen is, uh, you know, it's a huge disappointment with uh, with all that was invested in it. So and all the money, um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, so another question people had was, uh, you know, we know that, um, you know, the, the Gemini capsule um, was flown by, uh, you know, by Neil Armstrong and David Scott. But uh, but people wanted to know, um, you know, the the rocket that was up there, um, the Aegea, how, how did that get up there without a, uh, any pilots on it? Okay, so actually the Aegea was a an unmanned booster. It was normally a second stage booster built by Lockheed, and it was used by the Air Force and NASA to launch probes and satellites. But for Project Gemini, they used it for this rendezvous and docking target, and it would be launched on top of an Atlas booster ahead of the Gemini on the same morning from a different pad. So they put it up there in orbit, and then they were able to use what's called the digital command system from the ground to guide it and to put it in its various paces so they can put it in the proper orbit for uh, waiting for the Gemini to get there. Now, after the mission, they actually saved it, and they actually placed it in a higher parking orbit, and then they used it again on Gemini 10. That's really amazing. I was actually just about to ask what what happened to it, you know, once they undocked and left. But um, thank you. That's um, again, it's, you know, it's expensive equipment and a lot to, uh, you know, a lot of work to get it up there. So uh, it's pretty, pretty incredible how, how much mileage NASA gets out of, uh, of each of these missions. Well, the interesting thing, too, is that we didn't mention this, but David Scott, while they're spinning, actually thought of and nobody would have blamed him, blamed him if he had not thought of it. But his responsibility was to communicate with the Agena. So he realizes, oh, I need to shut down my encoder controller to give the ground access to the Agena so they can do what they need to do with it. If he had not done that, they would have lost the Agena and would have a lot of taxpayer money down the drain. So Dave actually uh, was very, very situationally aware, kept a cool head too, and saved the Agena. So. That's amazing. In a situation like that, where you're fearing for your own life to uh, to be conscious of the rest of the mission, but I guess that's you know why why those guys were chosen for uh, for those kind of roles, which uh, which brings to we have just a lot of questions about Neil Armstrong in general, right? You guys are at at you know his museum and uh, and everyone kind of knows him as you know one of the, the greatest heroes in in world history, you know especially in in space history. Um, so a uh, couple questions people had, so you know I think a lot you know everyone knows about uh, Apollo 11 and the moon land. Ending. Not as many knew about but this mission coming in. What can you tell us about other missions that uh, that he did? What else did he accomplish other than you know getting back to the wrong ocean? But we'll uh, we'll give him credit for getting back to Earth and uh, for getting to the moon. Did you want? Go ahead. Okay. So before he became an astronaut, Neil Armstrong was a NASA test pilot for about seven years, and during that time he worked on a lot of different projects. He worked on the X-15 rocket plane. He actually flew that seven times. Um, so he flew a lot of different types of experimental aircraft, the X-1B, the X-14, uh, the X-15. He flew the aircraft that sits out in front of our museum, the F-5. Uh, so he was doing a lot of, of flight research for NASA before he ever became an astronaut. And then once he became an astronaut and he resigned from NASA in 1971, he became an aerospace engineer professor at the University of Cincinnati. And he was there for about eight years. So that's one thing that was important to him was education. 
And so uh, that's kind of a neat thing, you know. But yeah, he was involved in all kinds of, of uh, engineering, aeronautical engineering. That was his degree, actually. And speaking of degrees, uh, David Scott's uh, degree, when he flew with Neil in 66, he had an MIT uh, master's degree in interplanetary navigation. So, so uh, these guys were really sharp. They were really sharp. That well, you know, you you would imagine so, right? At that point, you know, there weren't that many people who had been up to space. And you think of all the quick thinking that was required and, and understanding of you know how those um, you know all the thrusters worked and everything. Um, I think I think we made the right choices, which which leads to another set of questions. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how was you know there was only ever going to be one first person on the moon? Um, do we know how how was Neil Armstrong in particular selected for that? Um, did his experience on this mission and, and thinking quickly to a, to avert crisis was that one of the factors? You know, what do we know about how how he was selected for what ultimately became um, you know that uh, that giant leap for mankind? So the selection actually was a little different than a lot of people assume. All the astronauts were in a in a rotation of assignments. So whether it's Gemini or Apollo, if you were the backup commander on a particular mission, unless something happened, three missions later, you would rotate to the prime commander. And that's actually the way it happened most of the time. So Neil was the backup commander for Apollo 8. Three missions later, he rotates to the prime commander. Now there were other considerations, like how are we gonna get the first person to step out on the moon? Which guy are we gonna do? We're gonna have which one do that? And there was some discussion about that, obviously, because this is the first time. They know they have to make the right choice because if they make the wrong choice and the individual becomes world famous and he can't handle it and he becomes a babbling alcoholic or he, you know, he goes off the deep end or something, well, they want to prevent that. So they know that this is a hugely historic, very responsive, responsible position. So Neil Armstrong was known at that time to have a, a very, very steady kind of a personality. They trusted him. And it also happens that the design of the lunar module factored in. So Grumman, who built the lunar module, built the, the forward hatch to open to the inside to the right. The commander standing on the left, the pilot is standing on the right. If you open that hatch to the right, the pilot, who's Buzz Aldrin, is going to get pinned against the bulkhead on the right. The commander has the opportunity then to turn around, get down on his hands and knees, put his feet out the hatch, and go out. Then you can close the hatch, the pilot can move over to the left, open the hatch again, and then get out. So it was very restricted space, and the hatch only opened to the right. So that helped make that decision a little easier for the management. That's unbelievable that it came down to, you know, just sort of a logistical detail in that way of between the two of them, uh, who would go out first, but um, yeah. definitely seems as though uh, Neil Armstrong was, was the right choice. Um, and, uh, you know, just really amazing that, uh, that we get to learn so much about, um, you know, this, this other mission of his that, uh, you know, I think so many people didn't, you know, don't know about uh, just because it's also overshadowed by the moon landing, but uh, sure. it was really, really incredible. And thank you guys. Um, well, so with that in mind, Let's, let's talk a little bit more about Neil Armstrong. Um, if if folks are lucky enough to uh, to be able to uh, to visit, um, what uh, what other types of things can they see, and and what are some of your you know favorite um, you know tales to be told or artifacts to be shown at the Armstrong Air and Space Museum? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, different places that you can go in town. You can see um, some of the old buildings, of, like the old store that he used to work in. It's, it's now a different store today, but it's still there. You can see his boyhood home from when he was in high school. Um, Port Canada, you can go to where it was, and that's the airfield that Neil learned to fly. And um, yeah, I mean, Neil's one of those that when you guys turn 16 and you get your pi or you get your license or you, be you get your car, Neil, he got his pilot's license at 16. So he would ride his bicycle to Port Canada, fly planes and then ride <laughs> his bicycle home before yeah. he even knew how to drive a car. Yeah. So he kind of took a different approach to that. That's one of my favorite stories to share when I'm out there on the floor too, talking with people as well. Um, but yeah, so you can see that it's now farm territory today and farmland. So you, can, you, this, you can't see some of the actual buildings or structures that used to be there. But there's plenty of places that just driving around the area too, just the history that it has to share. And then I'll let Greg go into more with some of the artifacts that we have in here to share as well. So yeah, we, as Chris mentioned, we have a lot of personal items that were given to Neil Armstrong during that world tour. We have a lot of medallions, we have a lot of medals, awards, 
ribbons, keys to cities. We have paintings. We have all, all manner of, of uh, things that people donated because of their great respect for what he accomplished. So we have a lot of those in our museum. Uh, as I said, we have uh, you know his Gemini suit. Uh, we have the Aronka Champ, that actual aircraft he learned to fly in. That's in our museum, hanging on the wall, which is kind of nice. It's an odd place for an airplane to be, but it's, uh, it's here. And so we have a rocket engine from the Apollo uh, era. Um, we have just various numbers of small artifacts, things that uh, uh, you know accompany the, the narrative uh, from Mercury uh, through uh, Apollo and a little after. We actually have a modern gallery. We talk about the shuttle program, the uh, space station and so forth. We have a lot of things that we also want people to know about the modern program. So yeah, I mean, uh, it's hard to just go into a lot of, uh, to go to a list, if you will, of a lot of the old artifacts uh, because the big ones are, are so significant. But uh, if people want to come and they want to spend about an hour and a half, they will be able to see a film, which is a very good film, about a half hour, and then they'll have about an hour to go through and read and, uh, and enjoy uh, the various galleries and the things in those galleries that are significant. As an educator, too, one of the most exciting things that I, I find about the museum is, is our history continues to grow. Right. So the viewers that are, that are out there now, as you guys make history down the road, you could become part of our museum because our museum story continues to grow as the space program continues to grow right. and find out new discoveries. So, you know, we install exhibits now that are talk about Mars. In the future, I could be installing exhibits with some of the viewers' information that's like, hey, now we're landed there. Here's what we're doing there now. So mm -hmm. it's great because that history continues to grow right. here. Story doesn't end. Have. Yeah, the story just it keeps going and doesn't end. I love that. Yeah, space travel is, uh, is relatively young. And uh, you think of, you know, the you know, hundreds of thousands of years that people have been looking up at the moon and, and only relatively recently um, did, uh, did anyone get up there. So there's a lot more future to, uh, to space travel than there is history, which is, uh, is a pretty cool way to, uh, to think about it, which I guess leads me to one last question for you guys. Uh, for those who were inspired by tonight and uh, the story of, uh, of Neil Armstrong and David Scott to, you know, whether to become astronauts or to design, you know, even, even more capable, uh, you know, rockets and, uh, and, and spacecraft and those kind of things what um you know summoning what you know about uh, you know neil armstrong and, and some of the other you know i see there's a sally ride quote behind you some of the other um you know uh space personnel that uh that you've, you've dealt with at the you know the museum what's uh, what's your advice for those who are inspired right now uh may not have a uh, an airfield that uh that's within biking distance to uh to follow exactly neil's footsteps what's uh, what advice do you have I'd say, you know, if you're inspired, get, get involved, you know, get involved in something that you like, because astronauts, they're looking for astronauts from different, different types of knowledge bases, different types of skill things, sets. skill sets, yep. you know, so you just don't have to be a pilot to become an astronaut, you could be you could study trees, you could be a botanist, you could grow vegetables, fruits, you know, they're looking at that, structural engineers, just engineers in general, yeah. you know, they look for as well. So if you have something that's a career interest, you could potentially get into that, but then you could become a mission specialist as mm -hmm. in a passenger for the people that are flying, but then you could be the one to go to the moon or to Mars and then be solving some of these situations or encounter some of it, but using your skill set that you have. So get involved in your community, get involved in what you like, yeah. and then just let it grow so you know if it just if your plan takes you to school then go to school you know if your plan doesn't take you maybe to school right away but it moves you forward into another direction follow that path and then eventually you can maybe get into the path of space exploration and fly so that would be my my part of what i took from people that have visited and other astronauts but greg did you have yeah so if you uh, have designs on becoming an astronaut especially if you want to fly uh, the, one of the best things you can do is obviously uh, pursue an education in STEM field, but then you can go into the military and you can be an aviator in the uh, Air Force or the Navy. Those are your best bets. And uh, if you get that kind of experience, that is really a leg up on a lot of other applicants. Because even though other applicants may be qualified, it's always a good idea to have a pilot's license and have experience in jet aircraft. That's a really good way to become an astronaut. 
Well, thank you so much, guys. It's uh, it's been really inspirational. I asked that question because I know uh, you know hearing this story, I think uh, a lot of people are energized and uh, you know ready to, to run out and um, you know attack that uh, that next big you know NASA mission or SpaceX mission or Blue Origin mission or whatever it might be. Uh, so um, huge thanks to uh, to you and everyone at the museum for uh, for sharing um, you know all of your insight and uh, and knowledge here with everybody. Thanks everybody at home for asking such great questions. Uh, we always look forward to going to Instagram after these classes. Classes to, uh, to check out everybody's picture. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to put up our uh, instructions so you know exactly uh, who to tag to, uh, to be able to win that book and the uh, the three months of VT+. Plus. Um, this is not goodbye. It's just see you later. The Armstrong Museum is coming back a little bit later in the spring for uh, for some some more, um, you know, uh, exciting information about uh, other exploits of, uh, of the space program. So we'll see you guys again here pretty soon. And we'll see everybody else here uh, thank you. soon as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank Thank you very much. Okay.